is brought to you by my friends at Noble Gold. Ladies and gentlemen, protect your retirement with a gold IRA from my friends at Noble Gold. Ladies and gentlemen, gas is up, used cars are up, rent for apartments and houses are up, inflation is at a 40-year high, and it doesn't look like it's getting any better anytime soon. So what can you do? You can try trading stocks or buying mutual funds, but returns are shrinking fast. So what can you do? You might have heard about a gold IRA, but don't know much about them. That's why Noble Gold has a team of experts at the other end of a phone call. They'll put you straight on what you can and can't do to get yourself to financial safety again. And if you act quickly, they're giving away an incredible one-tenth ounce American Eagle gold coin proof with every qualifying IRA or 401k rollover. You can't go wrong with Noble Gold. That's why I trust them to protect my retirement. Call the team now at 877-646-5347 to find out more or visit my special link in the description of this video and get all your answers to all your questions about how to protect your retirement. Does the rehabilitation of war criminal George W. Bush show that when it comes to the crunch, liberals have no principles at all? The chief executive has got to be bold within reason and daring in application. I recognize very few people watching this will become president, but I think you'll find lessons in leadership that will apply to your life. Bush and his underlings sold a campaign of outright lies to the public in order to embroil the United States in a totally unnecessary war that killed between 150,000 and a million Iraqis and destabilized an entire region. He instituted a worldwide torture regime that continues to be a stain on the United States global image and which ensnared numerous innocent people. He instituted a vast, secret and illegal surveillance apparatus, most of which survives to this day. As president, sometimes I had information at the American American people didn't know and therefore I had to make decisions what was best for the country on knowledge that wasn't evident that's just the nature of leadership so long as you're guided by principle and so long as you're guided by a cause greater than self you can endure criticism because it's gonna come the liberal preoccupation with symbolic gestures and saying the right thing also led them to largely give Barack Obama an eight-year pass for carrying out policies that were as bad as and in some cases worse than Bush's one of the things I missed after the presidency was this daily learning, and thankfully painting came into my life. It's a learning experience because with every paint stroke, you learn something new. All right, I'm gonna do another flower. It's important to have a set of priorities that guide you, and your team, your company, your managers have got to understand those priorities. To me, the most important priorities were my faith in my family and my friends. That may sound corny to some, but it helps you reorganize the rest of your life. Welcome, Darren. Thanks, great, glad to be here. When I was speaking to audiences, I didn't want them to think I was smarter than they were. One of the keys to communication is to figure out how to enable the person you're talking to to relax. Bush's connection of 9-11 to Iraq was perhaps the deadliest conspiracy theory, aha, we like those, fake news or disinformation of the 21st century. I thought that was Joe Rogan taking ivermectin. On the home front, less than two months after 9-11 and weeks after Bush had already set up a secret surveillance program at the NSA, the Bush White House rammed through the Patriot Act. This long-time wish list of previously politically unthinkable proposals expanded the scope of national security surveillance and obliterated many of the key post-Watergate reforms of the 1970s. The FBI and Department of Justice criminalized and hounded supporters of Palestinian rights in the name of the war on terror, while Bush helped to censor information about the Saudis' role in the 9-11 attacks. The Saudis were, of course, longtime business partners of the Bush family. You know, I, had, I was a master at the Malaprop. Misunderestimate. The press corps reaction was, did the guy really just say that? <laughs> I remember right after 9-11 in the Oval Office talking about praying for families that had suffered loss. I broke down in tears. If your heart is touched, let people know that your heart is touched. Not everybody is going to be a leader, but everybody can end up being a better person. The challenge in life is not to attain 
wealth and status and power. What the rehabilitation of Bush shows us is that once the necessity for a certain narrative expires, the truth can be revealed. Bush is one of us. The Bush family and the Saudi royal family had relationships with one another. Think of how explosive that information was at the time that the Twin Towers went down, at the time of the Iraq war, at the time of ongoing relationships with Saudi Arabia. So let's think about now. What do you think we're going to learn about Hunter Biden in the future? What do you think you're going to learn about Joe Biden's relationships in China and Ukraine in the future, in 10 years time, when <laughs> Joe Biden might still be president, but he's dead. He can't be any worse, can he? The challenge of life is to improve and to learn to love better. And uh, everybody can do that. I'm George W. Bush, and this is Masterclass. Well, we certainly are learning from the world's best, some of the world's best manipulators and liars. The world's best systems are presenting us with apparent alternatives when really nothing changes, unless you happen to live in the Middle East, when you might be bombed to death for literally no reason. So, what does this news story show us? It shows us that ultimately figures that are presented as villains one moment can be represented as heroes ten years down the line because the priority for the establishment is its own preservation while maintaining the appearance of democracy. Was the it press? appropriate to bury the Hunter Biden? You're talking about the press doing that? He's saying that's what they did and that is what they did. They buried the Hunter Biden story before the election because they were like, we can't risk having the election thrown to Trump. We'll tell them after the election. And, and we know for a fact that that's what they did? Of course. You no, don't but follow I mean, this. Saying you you gotta... know for a fact that that's what they did? I don't know what they did. I know, because you only watch MSNBC. No, that's not true. <laughs> How do you guys handle things when they're a, a big news item that's controversial? Like, there was a lot of attention on Twitter during the election because of the Hunter Biden laptop story. The New yeah, York we Post. have that too. Yeah, so you guys censored that as well? So we took a different path than Twitter. Um, I mean, basically, the background here is the FBI, I think, basically came to us, uh, some, some folks on our team, and was like, hey, um, just so you know, like, you should be on high alert. There was, the, we, we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump of, of um uh, uh, that's similar to that. So just be vigilant. So our protocol is different from Twitter's. What Twitter did is they said, you can't share this at all. Um, we didn't do that. What, what we do is we have, um, if something is reported to us as potentially um, misinformation, important misinformation, we, we also have this third-party fact-checking program because we don't want to be deciding what's true and false. And for the, I think it was five or seven days when it was basically being... Um, being determined whether it was false, um, the distribution on Facebook was decreased, but people were still allowed to share it. So you could still share it, you could still consume it. So when um, you say the distribution is decreased, in, it, it got shared. It, how does that work? It basically the ranking in newsfeed was a little bit less. So fewer people saw it than would have otherwise. So it definitely by what percentage? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's 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 meaningful in the moment you had reason to believe based on the FBI talking to you that it wasn't real and that there was going to be some propaganda. So what do you do? Yeah. And then if you just let it get out there and what if it changes the election and it turns out to be bullshit, that's a real problem. And I would imagine that those kind of decisions are the most difficult. The decisions of like what is allowed and what is not allowed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what would you do in that situation? I don't know what I would do. I would have to like really thoroughly. Well, first of all, you're dealing with the New York Post, which is one of the oldest newspapers in the country. So I would I would say uh, I would want to talk to someone uh, from the New York Post, and I would say, how did you come up with this data? Like, where where are you getting the information from? How do you know whether or not this is correct? And then you have to make a decision because they might have got duped. It's it's very, it's hard because everybody wants to look at it after the fact. Now yeah. that we know that the laptop was real and that it was a legitimate story and there there is potential corruption involved with him, what we 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 think oh that should not have been restricted. That should not have been banned from sharing on Twitter. 
Right. I think everybody agrees with that. Even Twitter agrees with that. But the thing is, then they didn't think that. In the beginning, they thought it was fake. So what do they do? Like, yeah. if something comes along and the Republicans cook up some scheme to make it look like Joe Biden's a terrible person, and they only do it so that they can win the election, but it's really just propaganda. What do you, what are you supposed to do with that? You're supposed to not allow that to be distributed. So if they think that's the case, it makes sense to me that they would try to stop it. But I just don't think that they looked at it hard enough. I think you said people are conditioned to think. I, I think people are conditioned not to think anymore. They're right. conditioned to do exactly what they're told yeah. by their news station, by their politician. You know, people don't want to think for themselves anymore. So most people are conditioned to have someone lay the rules out for them, tell them when they're supposed to be there, tell them what they get when they work for an hour. That Most people don't have the ability to just think for themselves. It's been taken away from them because they want to make a living. And yeah, then you get in their student loans. <sighs> well, that's the craziest one, right? Because you can't even get rid of those. Right. Every other, every other, right. Uh, uh, every other loan, loan. Yeah. You can go bankrupt. You can bankrupt. Yeah. Except for student loans. I know of people that are getting Social Security docked. Their Social Security money is being docked because they owe student loans. So you're at the finish line. It's the end of your life. And you owe money for loans you took out when you were 18. And now you're 65. <sighs> That's a rough way to leave this life. It's, it's a rough... And, and the amount of interest based on it. I was reading about this woman who took out $150,000 in student loans. And now she owes 250000 because of all the interest and all the time. Yeah, and how much oh, over the course of that loan? What are you into? What are you paying? Like right. seven figures for sure, right? <laughs> it's off of crazy. that. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a fucking business, and it's also for many people something that they're not going to use for whatever occupation they choose. I mean, maybe it will help them get a job if it shows that they have a bachelor's in this or a master's in that. But there's a large amount of people out there that are out there working in a field that is not even their field of study in college. So they have this student loan that didn't even apply to what they wound up doing for a living, and then they have to pay it off forever. And it's subsidized by the government. So it's, a, it's an extraordinarily expensive endeavor. And you're making this choice when you're 18 and you don't know what the fuck you're doing. No. You have zero idea. It's the most vulnerable time in your life before you're... Your frontal lobe forms. You're you're not even 25 years old, and you're making these life decisions that will affect you forever. But it's not pushed. Uh, you know, it's shame. You're shamed almost yeah. if you don't go to college, right? Oh yeah. It's never pushed like, hey, go learn a technical st skill, right? Where you can do a year of apprenticeship or college or study, yeah. and then go make seven, six figures in a job. Hold on, hold everybody, time out. What well, I I. It's hard to digest the, the amount of misdirection in there. First, he says, one, I mean, this, let's just get to the, the shocking part. He admits that the FBI, with their guns and their badges and their power to take your life and your freedom, communicated with someone, whether in person I, I, or at, I don't know, at Facebook, a so-called private company, and with a wink and a nod, told them, you know, you really should make this Hunter Biden story go away. Then he admits they complied, and he tries to put lipstick on the pig by saying, Joe, the most comical part of the whole thing. No, no, we didn't censor it. We just made sure the distribution was reduced so a lot of people didn't see it. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, right. oh, okay. oh, great. Gosh, I'm, I'm totally at ease now. Thanks, Mark. What a bold decision that was. But there's another part of this that I'll bet some of you are figuring out already. The liberals are a little slow on this. He says, yeah, and the reason, you know, we did it at the behest of the FBI or at their wink and a nod, if you get what I mean, which makes it obviously a First Amendment issue. Liberals, it's a private company. Really? 
A private company deputized by the government to rig and interfere in an election that could damage a Democrat right before the election, and you're telling me they're acting as private actors? Please stop being stupid all the time. It's Friday. Take a break on Friday. from the, Take a vacation from stupid. There is established court precedent that a private company is not acting as a private company if they're doing something on behest of the government because the government can't do it itself. Please stop being stupid. Okay? I'm tired of the stupid from the left. But the part of that that should shock you the most is that they preemptively censored the story, reduced distribution. That means they censored it. It means you can't see it. Because they were told by the FBI that it could potentially be Russian propaganda. <laughs> you guys may not see where I'm going with this, but think about this. Think about the balls on this guy. So in the 2016 election, the 2016 election, where there were people warning on the inside and everywhere else at the FBI, there were people warning that the information Hillary Clinton's team was putting out about Donald Trump colluding with the Russians, that it may have come from shady Russian sources. That did nothing to stop, the, uh, stop Facebook from allowing every liberal talking head to use their platform to propagate obvious disinformation about Trump colluding with the Russians. That was actual Russian propaganda from foreign sources. That was okay. But the FBI then comes in in 2020 and says, hey, we think this could be Russian propaganda. Produces no evidence whatsoever it's true. Matter of fact, the evidence is that the laptop is real. They had the receipt and the laptop. And Facebook already jumps to it. Jumps to, oh, don't worry. We'll censor that and rig the election for you. Forget about the Zuckerbox thing. That's a whole other thing. This man, Mark Zuckerberg, is single-handedly responsible, I believe, for changing the course of the country for the worse. I say single-handedly because I, I believe with every DNA molecule of my being that without the Zuckerbucks and without Facebook actively interfering in 2020, we would have had a second term of Donald Trump. We wouldn't be going through this inflation crisis, this immigration crisis, this fentanyl crisis. I don't believe Putin would have invaded Ukraine. This man, I am not kidding, I believe destroyed planet Earth. And he has the, the, the moose nuts to go on this show and just blurt this out like it's nothing. I haven't even gotten to part two yet. Here's part two, where, again, he cites fact checkers. Well, we needed to give fact checkers time. Keep in mind as you're listening to this, he gave conservatives no such leeway with the collusion hoax everybody knew was fake. In other words, he didn't say, do you guys get where I'm going with this? That the 2016 election, while Donald Trump colluded with the Russians, was making its way around Facebook, a lot of it after the election, but some of it before via that New Yorker article. They made no effort at all to say, we're giving Facebook uh, fact checkers time to check this out. Before No, no, nothing. They allowed it to propagate still to this day. Right, right. Even though it's a debunked hoax. Still to this day. And he implies in this cut that the fact checkers are, are like neutral, nonpartisans, which is a joke. Everybody knows they're Democrat Party opinion makers. Facebook had to admit to it themselves in court that fact checkers don't check facts that their opinion make. They admitted to this in court. But listen to him cite the fact checkers as if, oh, look at them. They are like on now, Mount Olympus. They are so low. We don't get involved in that. Facebook, one of the most dangerous companies in the history of the planet. This guy, I'm telling you, may be single-handedly responsible for having set humanity on a destructive course by what he did and his company. Uh, there's a report out today from a committee out of uh, D.C., that only on student loans, the decisions that the federal government made has cost us $800 billion. That, that's not health care. That's not housing. It's student loans. That topic only at $800 billion. It's amazing. I mean, the, the, the number here, 300 billion, is really a number of different organizations are looking at this thinking it's actually could be closer to a trillion dollars when 
push comes to shove, uh, and you add it all up, and it, it, it exponentially uh, adds up. And if you look at the cost of college, just over the past 20 years, sometimes it's double, sometimes it's three times. Uh, and this is not going to help that in any way, shape, or form. The, the administration says they're going to have a task force that's going to ask colleges and universities to keep the prices down. But in the wake of this, <laughs> do we really think that that's going to happen? That's, just, that's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, so obviously a task force is always the answer. Um, I did also you know, think about yeah. this. Just a couple of months ago, the Biden administration argued that COVID was over and that way that they could get rid of the Title 42 provision down on the border. But apparently the COVID, it still exists for people who have student loans because they're not going to have to start paying back their loans until January. Right. Right. And amazingly, the, the December deadline is a month after November 8th. Right. Uh, you know, it all fits in together here. And and the emergency provisions at the border go away. The CDC rolls back the guidelines. You don't have to stay six feet. You know, you don't have to quarantine anymore. More. It's, it's pretty remarkable that this is the emergency provision that the Department of Education is using. I think the Office of Legal Counsel is going to see some challenges. Yeah. I don't know who's going to have standing to challenge it, but I think that there will be legal challenges to this. Right, we'll watch that. Another story as it relates to it, the House Judiciary Committee put out a, a statement on this. House Judiciary Republicans did. Mm -hmm. And they were blocked by Facebook. And they sent out this message that said, wow, Facebook says our post about paying back loans violates their, quote, community standards. Big tech's at it again. I don't know what the community standards would be here for those to think that big tech was backing off after the Hunter Biden stuff. Guess again, apparently. Yeah, and that's something to watch, really, as we get closer to November, how much uh, big tech and what they're doing as far as what can go on and what can't go on. We've seen this story before, and if it shapes up like it, the House Judiciary Committee is suggesting it is, um, if you're pushing back against the student loan program, that it gets somehow right. uh, censored, uh, that's a big deal, and it'll be a big story. We're going to take you through a little time line from Trump's departure from the White House and the classified information. Now we start right here. One day before the president left the White House, he issued this memo. Trump was declassifying certain materials re related to the FBI crossfire hurricane investigation. <gasps> what could that be? Now I want you to keep this in mind because President Trump has claimed that everything the FBI sees has been Declassified. Is it maybe this? Well, as you see the timeline, I think you're going to say, yeah. January 20th, he leaves the White House. Okay, he, he, uh, he uh, declassifies all the Russian Gate stuff. President Trump's chief of staff said most of the Russia Gate documents had been sent to the DOJ for uh, redactions. But as per Newsweek reporting, 27 boxes of material had been sent accidentally to Mar-a-Lago. Remember, this was not the political people. This was the GAO, the Government Accounting Office. They're the ones that packed everything up. So there weren't any political people. Well, this kicked off conversations between Trump's team and the National Archives to find out what needed to be shipped back. So let's, let's jump ahead to this year. On G in January, Trump team transferred 15 of the 27 boxes. They went to the National Archives. Now, some of those reportedly were marked classified. We still don't know, you know, if they were nuclear secrets or not. But part of the documents we know were declassified back in January 2020. Remember this. It also shows that Trump's team was working with the government. So why would you take an ex-president and march people out for a raid? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. On March 24th, in the middle of all of this, Trump stayed on track. Yeah. This is what he was really concerned about. He filed a RICO lawsuit going after Hillary Clinton and everyone else involved in Russiagate. You know, getting justice for the collusion fiasco that had been constant. Now, I find it interesting that this occurred at this time. Why? Well, it was just a couple of weeks later, on April 7th, that it was leaked to the Washington Post by 
unnamed DOJ sources because, of course, the DOJ was investigating improper removal of presidential records at Mar-a-Lago. Now, that's crazy timing, isn't it? I mean, boom, boom. Trump was trying to get Russiagate documents declassified. Some went to Mar-a-Lago and some got sent back to the archives. Then Trump files a lawsuit regarding Russiagate. And the men in black start saying, well, we should investigate because he's probably got nuclear secrets. In May, it was reported that the DOJ formally subpoenaed more documents. Something had them spooked. And I'm sure it had nothing to do with the RICO case, right? You know, consider that we're, we're not supposed to notice all of these little coincidences here. They're, they're convenient coincidence, but it's just coincidence. Now, you look at this timeline, which they don't want you to do, and you say, okay, all right, maybe. Then on May 12th, the Washington Post again had a leak at the DOJ. Unnamed sources, a tip at the DOJ, they were telling them now at the Washington Post that they were using a grand jury to issue a subpoena to the National Archives so they could see the 15 boxes that Trump teams handed over back in January. Now, why would they do that? Why, 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 would, why would they need to issue a, a, a call together a grand jury to read documents that Trump had already turned over to the government? Unless it was something they were afraid of. And I can't imagine what it might be. Anyway, on June 3rd, the FBI went to Mar-a-Lago. They got a tour of the vault where the documents were stored. I hope they had uh, the uh, ground steak because it's delicious. Anyway, the documents were stored. They looked through them. They were allowed to look through the boxes. Again, Trump is like, whatever, you want to go through the boxes. But after the DOJ looking through the docs at the archives, and now the FBI sending agents to rifle through the boxes at Mar-a-Lago, it looks like they're looking for something, you know, something that made them nervous. Oh, nothing's making me nervous. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Trump, clearly not concerned about anything he has had or had already given back to the government, is just standing there looking at them like they're a bunch of ridiculous apes. Now, here's where things start to get even weirder. On June 19th, Trump appointed former national security official Cash Patel and journalist John Solomon as his official representatives. He names them representative of the National Archive. Remember, for him. Remember, he had previously returned 15 boxes to the National Archives. The DOJ was concerned about them going so far as issuing a grand jury. And now Trump was sending his own guys, I assume, to see if there was any funny business going on. Remember Trump's primary objective here, and we saw that when one of his last acts was to, uh, oh, declassify all of the documents that would uh, show any kind of collusion at all with the FBI, DOJ, Hillary Clinton, you know, any of those people, maybe Joe Biden. He would like them to be seen, but the government doesn't seem too keen on that. Now, just two days later on June 21st, Trump kept on track. He continued his RICO lawsuit on Hillary Clinton and everybody else that was part of Russiagate. That same day, Cash Patel did an interview where he said this. To identify every single document. I can tell you now um, that I am a now officially a representative for Donald Trump at the National Archives. And I'm going to march down there. I've never told anyone this because it just happened. And I'm going to identify every single document that they blocked from being declassified at the National Archives. And we are going to start putting that information out next week. Next week. It wasn't too, too long later that all of a sudden, mid-July, Garland starts considering a green light on the unprecedented raid in Mar-a-Lago. Again, the word of this evening's program is convenient. We all know what happened next. The FBI commenced with a raid on August 8th. One day after the raid, August 9th, the well-respected investigative journalist Paul Sperry was permanently suspended on Twitter for doing his job as a investigative reporter. He tweeted, investigators reportedly met back in June with Trump and his lawyers in Mar-a-Lago storage room to survey docs and things seemed copacetic. Okay. 
True. Then the FBI raids weeks later. All true. Speculation on Hill. FBI had personal stake in searching for classified docs related to its Spygate scandal. Oh my gosh. He added then, in other words, the FBI might be covering his own, their own tracks while using the Presidential Records Act as a pretext for the Mar-a-Lago search. Huh. What part of that got him shut down? By the way, do you know one of the guys that was working for the FBI um, and was part of all of this stuff? He's now working at Twitter. Isn't that weird? Sperry would later publish this piece revealing that many of the FBI agents that were involved with the Russiagate thing were are now leading the investigation on Mar-a-Lago. Wait, did you hear that? I mean, it wasn't just me, right? Last week, last week, August 17th, that's when he put that, because Newsweek also reported that the FBI was in search of documents that included Trump's collection of papers showing who was involved in Russiagate. Hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but you look at the timeline, and it looks like they're looking for these papers. Let me ask you a question. If you're going to commit a crime, do you keep the video cameras in your home on 24-7? I don't know. Would you? It seems kind of stupid, doesn't it? Or would you do it in front of the Secret Service? I don't know. That seems kind of stupid, doesn't it? Well, that's what you're expected to believe. My God. We got the affidavit. It's fascinating. It's unbelievable. Look, look. Oh, somebody knows how to use a magic marker and a ruler. And there they are. But we have seven sentences. Let's see if we can figure out what's taking place. Ooh, look at this. I'm the senior legal analyst of this show right here. And they keep moving the ball and they keep leaking. They want absolute secrecy. But let's start with this point. If I'm wrong. And the other side is right. How is it that Hillary Clinton is still walking on the earth free? She should be getting 50 life consecutive sentences for her violations of the Espionage Act. How is it that Jim Comey is still work, walking on the face of the earth free? Same with him. We know Hillary had a server in her home to gather information, including classified information. That violates the Espionage Act. There's simply no question about it. And when confronted with it, was her home searched? Was there a search warrant? I don't seem to recall. Do you? Did 30 FBI agents go to Chappaqua? I don't think so. Gee, Willikers. And I seem to remember her lawyer, David Kendall, had a big role in deciding what the government would and wouldn't see. Oh, and then we had hammers on iPhones and bleach software and all the rest of it. Obstruction? Oh, of course not. It's Hillary. And she wasn't even president, except in her mind. So she didn't even have the protections attendant to a president. What about James Comey, the head of the FBI, a lawyer, former U.S. attorney, Southern District? He would know the law, wouldn't he? I think so. Well, didn't he take documents with him? I think he did. Some of them classified? I think they were. Did he leak them? He leaked some. My goodness. Shouldn't he be doing time, too? Maybe in the same prison these days, where women are men and men are women. But no, James is out there making money. He's on TV. He's just fantastic. What the hell has gone on here? Everybody, the media, oh, what's in the affidavit? What's happened here is disgusting. And I see they're attacking Trump. It's always Trump. It's not his enemies. It's not the government. It's always Trump's, no matter... How we prove that the FBI, the intelligence services, the Democrat Party, and the media are corrupt as hell. No matter how many times we go through this, it's Trump. Trump, you see, he took documents home. Well, you should know better than that. Take documents home with him. Let me walk through this quickly. Former president has the legal right to access any and all of the documents created during his presidency, classified or otherwise. Period. The second before he left office, by his very actions alone in taking documents, he could be said to have declassified them. Are you sure about this, Mark? I'm certain about it. 
In fact, this was discussed at some length in 2017 when he handed certain information classified to the Russian foreign minister. Not because Trump's a spy, because he thought it was no big deal. So the former president cannot be charged under the Espionage Act of 1917 for this reason and more, including Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, the very first sentence. He is the executive branch, and he's the commander-in-chief. Subordinates can't tell him, you didn't fill out this paper. Agencies can't tell him. And so in 2017, like today, once the president acts a certain way, it's assumed by his actions that something can be declassified. At a minimum, this is a constitutional issue, right? So why would the Department of Justice open up this bag of worms? Why would it do that? Now imagine if a president or ex-president could be charged with endless debates over bureaucratic processes, followed or not followed, and the impact that would have on the ability of any president to actually be president and do his job. Yes, I took little notes to make sure I get this right. Now among other reasons as well, this is why many of us argue that a sitting president cannot be indicted. Obviously, Trump here is a former president, but that gets back to my earlier point about interpreting a president's actions upon his departure. Oh, I've heard some Republicans and Democrats say, where's the evidence? Did he cross this? Because they? they're not constitutionalists. They're like former federal prosecutors, professors of this out of the other, political operatives. Listen to me, because these are the challengers should the Department of Justice be so outrageously foolish to proceed on the path they're on. Now we get to document possession, that issue. Under the Presidential Records Act of 1978, there are no penalties, none, and no enforcement mechanisms, none. The point is, the second after the president leaves office, he's not subject to criminal charges or penalties if he has documents or other information that he secured or took while he was president one second before he left office. The act anticipates negotiations, that is the Presidential Records Act, between a former president and the archivist related to the nature of the information, whether he thinks it's private or not private, the disposition of the information, whether he thinks it's classified or declassified. This is a process, a process. That said, other than the boxes seized by the FBI, obviously millions of, listen to me, millions and millions of pages of records created in the Trump administration are controlled by the archivist. So we're talking about a relative few here. This fact and the fact that there have been lawyer to lawyer negotiations over the remaining boxes for some time, as well as voluntary access to the former president's home, where the FBI went, found the boxes, were shown the boxes, looked in the boxes, and by God, I don't know why, if they say, wow, look at that. That's super secret, super duper secret. They didn't just take it. They could have. But this belies the absurd claim that Trump stole government property or obstructed the archives somehow or had criminal intent. They're negotiating. Indeed, the former president was out of office only 12 months when this issue publicly arose in January and February about boxes that became known. That's a very short period of time. Sometimes negotiations have gone on for years. Certainly no reason to pull a search warrant trigger. Now, if there was some sudden urgency in controlling these documents, there were many ways to obtain them without resorting to the criminal process. Why is there a criminal grand jury in place? And when was that impaneled? And it's the same U.S. attorney in Washington overlooking January 6th with a grand jury who's looking over the National Archives issue with a grand jury. Suspicious? I am. It's shocking that a federal grand jury in Washington has been impaneled in the first place. Not to mention spies and others at Mar-a-Lago, according to ooh, this affidavit. Secretly leaking to the FBI. What's going on here? Even if it's believed that documents are being moved or destroyed, the FBI had the power to remove them via subpoena enforced by a subsequent court order if necessary. You go in there in June, you go, holy mackerel. Look at these documents. We got this, that, we got, let's go back to the judge and get another subpoena. But they didn't have to get another subpoena or court order as far as we know, based on what we know right now. Why? Because nobody stopped them. Nobody stopped them. 
Now, if there's actual evidence something was destroyed in real probable cause and the government truly believes a crime was committed by somebody, then go to a real judge, not a master, and seek an arrest warrant. But what occurred here was the issuance of a general warrant, which is clearly unconstitutional. We have a whole history in this country of this, in violation of the Fourth Amendment. It needs particularity. And if they knew which documents they were looking for, then the language that they put in the proposed search warrant and signed off by this master, they had to know that they were issuing a general warrant. It enables the government to grab everything, everything in sight for a period of nine hours. They were looking and looking, even searched the former first lady's clothes closet. Wow, we know they hid those super duper secret documents there, don't we? That's why, at least in part, this indicates the use of a pretext to search for information related to other matters like January 6th. It's no accident that the same U.S. attorney is overseeing both investigations. Also, why was a matter of such constitutional consequence heard by a master, not an Article III Senate-confirmed federal judge? And if there was some kind of urgency, Attorney General Garland has a funny way of showing it. He was slow to authorize the seeking of a search warrant. He took two or three weeks to noodle over it. What should I do? I'm going after parents. I'm going after people who oppose abortion. I'm going after state legislatures. I refuse to enforce the law on the border. I've got so much to think about. And once secured, the warrant wasn't executed for three days or so. Again, this is why there's speculation about the government's actual intentions. Now, when you consider what Hillary Clinton did and Jim Comey, and that's not it. They're not the only ones. And they weren't president, and they weren't former presidents, and how they were treated versus how this former president is treated. Now you can see what's going on here. It's another disgusting ruse. Over documents, seriously? Over documents, seriously? Over documents the FBI could have gone in there and just taken without a search warrant? And now you have former federal prosecutors. I've had about enough of them. They're really a dime a dozen, all over cable, all over network TV. He clearly violated the Espionage Act. It's obstruction. He stole the documents. Yeah, he sure did. They have no damn idea what the hell they're talking about. This is an assault, an assault on Trump and his supporters, an assault on the Republican Party, an assault on our country. Unless Hillary Clinton and Jim Comey do life sentences for what they did, right? How many violations of the espionage did they commit? So late. 